I had a bunch of people reach out to me on TikTok saying, what can we do? Is there anything we can do? We came together, we had a chat about, is there anything that can be done? And that's how we kind of came up with, don't ban me, license me. I'm always really careful not to say end BSL. I feel like that's the thing that a lot of people say. And what makes a responsible dog owner? Making sure their dog is as safe as possible for themselves and those around them. Yeah. And their dog is as fulfilled as possible yeah. at the same time. The top 10 best dog trainers that I know of all have an accumulation of followers, probably less than 30,000. Yeah. But there's dog trainers out there with quite literally millions of followers. I can watch them train a dog. And again, if my staff were training dogs in that way, in a perfect world, should we license this breed of dog? Like, how would that look? Some of the things to do with the ban, a lot of people have said, oh, but the ban basically is a license, which yeah. we disagree with because it's a shame that we live somewhere where 30 years ago this legislation that was described as the worst piece of legislation that the government had thrown together is now being reenacted. People chose to put money in because they believed that this law was not the right way to do things yeah. and that's incredible and I also think it's really important to hold the government to account. Yeah. When do you ever get the Just... chance to do that? This week on Caffeine and Canines, I am joined by Sophie Coulthard, a canine activist who is the driving force of the movement. Don't ban me, license me. In this episode, we talk about obviously the contentious subject of the XL Bully ban, the genetics of the XL Bully, how we should go best about training our XL Bullies and what can we do in the face of this ban to potentially help our XL Bullies out. Brilliant episode, really fascinating. And I think both Sophie and I learned a lot. I hope you enjoy it. Can you tell me what this um, Don't Ban Me, Licence Me movement is, please? Have we started? No. <laughs> we came out of, um, obviously the ban was announced in mid-September. Yeah. I was quite active on TikTok at the time and I was getting quite political about my opinions on the ban and alternative solutions. Were you on TikTok as a dog owner? I was wanting to get videos off my phone and I thought I'll put them on TikTok. Okay. And that was literally it. Okay. Um, yeah, no, I'm not a trainer, I'm just a regular dog owner and I enjoy training my dog. Yep. I find I get a lot out of it and I think he does as well. Yes. So I, um, yeah, I, I had a bunch of people reach out to me on TikTok saying, what can we do? Is there anything we can do? We came together, we had a chat about, if, is there anything that can be done regarding the ban for a start from a legal perspective? And, um, you know, could we could we campaign for a different solution or mm -hmm. a, a solution in the future? And that's how we kind of came up with don't ban me, license me. It just does what it says on the tin, really. OK, conceptually, that is what? Well, what was the end goal? What would be the ultimate goal the if end... things went your uh, the way for yeah. the movement? So I think uh, I'm always really careful not to say end BSL. I feel okay. like that's the thing that a lot of people say. Yeah. And the government no government is just going to remove breed specific legislation it's not going to happen what's you can imagine the daily mail headlines about people breeding pit bulls and things like that yeah. but is there room to put up a scaffolding for a new solution so that we don't need to keep adding breeds to the banned breed list and what could that look like and i think particularly when you look at other countries and you see how other countries do things a lot of them are moving towards a licensing model okay and it's proving to be more successful because i think that it makes the responsibility the, the owner's responsibility yeah to be a good dog owner you must see this all the time of course what what makes a responsible dog owner making sure their dog is as safe as possible for those and them for those it's for themselves and those around them. Yeah. And their dog is as fulfilled as possible. Yeah. At the same time. I like that. So you've got a dog. You've brought it into your life. Like, he didn't ask to be bought. Right? So you've got to try and do as best you can by that dog by giving him the life, his genetic makeup most desires. But also maintain, make sure that dog is safe for himself, yourself, yeah. and those that he's going to be exposed to. And then yeah. everyone's happy, right? I think so. Um, sometimes, and I, since I'm a dog trainer that uses tools, um, I'm often labelled like tyrannical and and and, dom and a dominion over my dogs because of, like, I expect control of my dogs. But that's the safety element. If they're not safe to themselves and those around them, then they can't be 
adequately fulfilled because of I'm limited in what I can do with them. Yeah. So um, I think there's that element there. Yeah, I could go off on a tangent. I will. I will. Can I go off on a tangent? Yeah, of course. Well, I walked my dog um, yesterday. Yeah. On a prong collar. Yeah. We're walking down the road, and ahead of us, I can see someone with another dog. Yeah. Different breed. And they were struggling with that dog. Mm -hmm. It was pulling, it was yanking into the road, it was barking, it was doing all sorts. I thought there must have been something up ahead, and there wasn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then I saw them sit their dog down and lecture their dog, which I always find okay. amusing. Yeah, you know, yeah, let's yeah. tell the I dog off. With their dog, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then off they went up the road, and um, she was holding the dog's lead so tight that the dog basically was was being dragged yeah. down the road on yeah. a flat collar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I thought, so there's a dog that's not learning anything. They're not being able to make a choice, to yeah. make the right choice or yeah, the yeah, wrong yeah. choice. Yeah. Meanwhile, I'm walking my dog on a prong collar, collar, which people could say is cruel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's making his decision. Yes. And, yeah. So dogs only think about, like, the first acute three seconds in front of them. They don't think long term. Yeah. So they're like, I can pull into this collar for three seconds and hopefully I'm going to get to A to B as quick yeah, as possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? What they don't realise is over a 15 minute walk, they're causing themselves a lot of access pressure because they don't think of the acute 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour, hour in front of them, which we can figure out. Yeah. They only think about like what's directly in front of them. So they will go through momentary discomfort that accumulates to chronic discomfort yeah. over time because of we've not taught them like how to avoid momentary discomfort, right? So yeah. when people argue against tools and methods and use an aversion or discomfort, Often the acute discomfort we apply in order to teach our dog to avoid chronic discomfort um, is the safer, fairer option for yeah. our dog than like them. So once upon a time, I work, I've told this on the podcast before, but I worked with a spaniel that pulled into a harness so much so that it changed the gait of how he walked. God. Couldn't be let off a lead, so he couldn't like walk normally. He'd like run around the house a little bit, but when he was walked on a lead, he would pull so much so that when we then taught him to walk nice on a loose lead, his gait of how he walked was almost like a lizard. And he needed two shoulder reconstructions because of that oh as well, gosh. because of like he'd developed physiologically improper in a way. Yeah. So that for the owner at the time was like the nicest thing to do, like walk the dog on a on a on a uh, harness and avoid yeah. giving him any correction to like how to avoid like pulling on the lead. But long term consequence was the dog needed uh, two shoulder reconstructions and, oh and my or it could have been elbow and was on great rest for like six the, months the owner could need that as well yeah, I, yeah, I, sure. I started you know like uh, you know I'm I'm a dog owner yep. not been in the training world before not did not know these words of force free re reactive all of yeah, these yeah, yeah. sorts of words were just not you know grew up with dogs but not I think social media and the rise of you know training being available online teaches you th these yes. things so yeah i mean i was i was started puppy harness seems like the nicest thing of course then flat collar yeah then slip lead then yeah, yeah. but but i was getting a bad back and a bad shoulder from yeah. him pulling as much as we do the work do the work yeah it's anyway we've gone off on one that's okay <laughs> we've gone off on one. it happens but i think a lot of people um you know, a lot of people with bigger, more powerful dogs, obviously the XL bully is, is one of those dogs. Yeah. Maybe, you know, maybe they resist tools. But when I look at particularly women who have this type of dog, yeah. and particularly the ones that are quite um, on, online, mm -hmm. you notice, I notice a pattern that we all seem to train the same way. We all seem to use the same tools. And it's like, this must be something working then. Yeah, 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 of course. And um, even the online dog training sphere of of let's call it force free using motivational base methods like the application of them aren't typically very good in amongst the big online trainers so there's a couple of big online force free trainers whose timing and and motivational based work is so poor if i saw any of my staff training a dog in that way i would absolutely tear them a fucking God. new one so it's not just like the camps are wrong per se like innately wrong it's the application of training available online is um being delivered by people that are very good at marketing yeah not necessarily very good at dog training yeah, so this yeah, is a conversation yeah. i have a lot especially with everyday dog owners like the top 10 best dog trainers that i know of have all have an accumulation of followers, probably less than 30,000. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, but there's dog trainers out there with quite literally millions of followers 
I can watch them train a dog. And again, if my staff were training dogs in that way, I'd be pulling them in and having a serious word saying they need to change things yeah. immediately. Right. So we can't just say like force free is better than uh, use, utilizing tools and, and back and forth. Like, unfortunately, we're in a realm where we consume the information we want to hear, not information we necessarily need to hear. And because of those are good at, that are good at marketing, give them information that we want to hear, not the information yeah. we need to hear. It creates like this a, a snowball effect and an echo chamber yeah. of how we how the internet tells us how a dog should be trained yeah as opposed to how a dog is most effectively trained or or whatever yeah. so like we can get a really we can get really far with motivational based methods and that's proven time and time again with our like working dogs and our working malinois puppies and things like this um and if our average layperson like got into that with their dog and that even that was promoted correctly then we would wouldn't have to use as much aversion but more often than not like aversion um takes its has its place when things don't go perfect as a puppy yeah now everyday dog owners aren't going to do things perfect when the dog's a puppy and the puppy's going to pick up lots of bad habits and that might be pulling on a lead it might be pulling towards other dogs it might be a little bit of reactivity in the home and sometimes that habit is ingrained and becomes so strong that sometimes we need to use a little bit of hey no 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 yeah. in order to try and try and stop that yeah, and that's yeah. the fact of the matter and people don't really like that because of people have experienced being training train a dog whether it is low in drive and low in prey drive uh, with motiva motivational only methods and therefore pushes it on everyone else like oh, i did yeah. my one dog like this my labrador like this like you can do it with your xl bully yeah. i don't care oh, if he gosh, weighs 50 yeah. kilos or whatever <laughs> like i was able to do it with these three labradors here there's no reason that you can't do it yeah and that's just not realistic because of like each and every dog has different desires drives and most importantly probably arguably uh history of reinforcement of what they found success in in the past yeah. um, and that drives a lot of behavior so repetition drives behavior and if your dog's had a lot of like success in like pulling on the lead to the park every day and the the everyday dog owner unbeknownst like takes the dog off a lead and rewards all that pulling and that happens 50 times 100 times a thousand times like pulling's gonna get gonna be yeah. like really difficult to stop that dog doing because of like he's found so much success yeah. in like pulling to the park and then being let at liberty, which is like the ultimate reinforcement. And it's the ultimate reinforcement because if whilst the dog is at liberty, he takes any reinforcement he wants because he's at liberty, right? So um, I'm off on a tangent now. You but, know your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that's the difficulty that everyday dog owners are faced with when they're getting dragged pillar to post and like yeah. how to train a dog, right? So like I can't help but emphasize empathize with everyday dog owners because there's just so much fucking shit out there oh, and gosh. when you then go and get a big fucking powerful breed mm -hmm. like your xl bullies that like a slight problem i have is like they're like softened down because of like all the information about them and like we get like an opposition reflex like we hear of an xl bully killing someone and then on the other side of things we're like mine is perfect it's so soft it couldn't ever hurt anyone which is probably true about that one particular dog yeah it allows then everyday dog owners to like not take the dog, take that same puppy on with a pinch of salt. Like things yeah. can go wrong, All right? So um, I have a question for you and I'll, I'll shut up about dog training methods that I'm very <laughs> passionate about. Um, in a perfect world, should we license this breed of dog? Like how would that look? Yeah, so obviously um, some of the things to do with the ban, a lot of people have said, oh, but the ban basically is a license, which yeah. we disagree with because obviously you're restricted in terms of the muzzle, the lead. Yeah. But then there's other things as well. You lose your health insurance when you have a banned breed for the dog. Yeah. So people with older dogs particularly, we've had so many messages from people who've got like eight-year-old, 10-year-old, 12-year-old XL bullies that they're now having to neuter um, yeah, yeah, yeah. at that age and, and things like that. So th there's a lot more having to muzzle your dog in the car yeah. So it just makes you, it's just shit. You, you're going on a long car journey and you're like, oh, so now my dog, dog needs to be muzzled when we leave the house in the car on the other side. It's, yeah. it's hard. It's not easy. A li how a license could be different, and we believe that all dog owners should be licensed, yep. um, is first of all, firstly, 
before you get a dog or within however long of getting a dog, you have to get the license. Yep. That could really stop a lot of impulse buying, yeah, which okay. is a problem that we yeah, have yeah, in this yeah, country. Yeah. Um, you know, you can buy a dog off Facebook. Just slows the process down to the yeah, point that, like, yeah. we can think about our choices. Yeah. That's and a good idea. I'm going to throw things out there that are not like, these are our rules of what we think. But, you know, there's different things, take different things from different countries that are doing it successfully. Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of places, a lot of countries have certain, um, just like your driving theory test, mm -hmm. but to do with dogs. Mm -hmm. So even just... Um, finding the right breed for you. Uh, yeah. Like, just just some of the basics yep. um, could really make a difference as well from people taking on a dog. Um, obviously, uh, as well as licensing owners, licensing breeders, yeah. which I think is the root of the, the issue. Um, yeah. And I think that that's been the issue with the XL bully as yeah. well, you know. Um, and maybe you've probably seen this in the work that you do is that, we had a bit of a combination of the pandemic, mm -hmm. the population of dogs exploding, yep. dogs suddenly becoming a valuable commodity. Yep. And as soon as you make something valuable, you get crime or yes. you know corruption, whatever you want to call it. Around it. So you have people breeding dogs, any two dogs, with yep. no thoughts of temperament or socialization or any yep. of that. that and then you've got, you've got a breed that has featured in lots of, you know, Hollywood rap videos and this, yeah, that and yeah, the yeah. other. So you, you've then got this kind of status symbol that yes. comes with the dog. Um, and maybe we will see it happen with another dog in the future. I'm sure we um, will. Hopefully no pandemic. But I feel like the pandemic really must have sort of concentrated. Fuel to the fire for sure, like yeah. sped things up. Yep. So if breeders were licensed, and it was interesting because there was an um, EFRA, Environmental Food Regulator, the, the people that discuss these things and make the laws, were discussing whether to license breeders recently. Yeah. And it was recorded. And you hear them discussing it and they're like, oh no, because you know, if my Spaniel wants, I want my Spaniel to have some puppies and I want to be able to give them to some friends, so let's not bother doing that. Yeah. And it's literally, that's the decision. Yeah. When you think, when it comes to things like animal welfare, how many dogs we have in rescues, mm -hmm. how many dogs have got Prob behavioral problems maybe because they for whatever reason poorly bred or, or not a responsible owner yep. it i mean it's probably good for you it keeps you in business yeah, for it sure. business good but it's um you know it's it have there ever been so many problems with dogs in this country no never so i do think that we need to start to think what else? I mean, it's, we're not very good at doing this as a country, are we? And, no. You know, I'm not going to have much nice to say about the government in that sense. But how often do we look at other countries and go, well, they're doing it mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. um, in Spain, I think you need to have certain licenses around bigger dogs as well, yeah, which okay. could be a consideration. Um, so I think I think that side of things is important. I think education is important as well. Yeah. Do we have enough education in schools mm -hmm. about how to be around dogs? Yeah. Um, and enforcement of the law, which yeah. is so loose at the moment. Um, there is a video that went quite viral of a man beating his XL bully in a, in a garden. Yeah. Um, and he's been given a 12-month ban. Right. You know. So Crazy. in a year's time, he can go and get himself a Belgian Malinois if he yeah, wants yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think we need to think about how that plays out in five years time yeah i think if there's more hurdles for just breeders just as a like to be, be a, a home border of the dog like it's a lot more hurdles and regulations than it is to go and breed dogs right yeah it's like to make dogs and like they could be any breed of dog they could be belgian malinois they could be your corsos or whatever the, the whoever the next popular dog is going to be so I think putting hurdles in place for them and starting it there just to like weed out people that are just doing it for a quick buck, yeah. right? Like make it as hard as fucking possible to breed dogs. Like we don't need more dogs. No. People don't need dogs. So for some reason, the dog which was once upon a time a luxury is now like an obligation for people to have. Like mm. you don't you don't need you don't need to go and get a dog if your lifestyle doesn't fit a dog. Like you don't you don't need to go and get one and you you definitely don't need to breed your dog that yeah. is potentially like a bag of nerves but for me obviously like we work with a lot of puppies we're getting a lot of nervous puppies in and i've got my theories on why puppies are more nervous than ever uh, but most part i do believe you sorry do you want to share 
Yeah, of course. Um, most part, I believe there's a, a genetic component there. Right. Um, there's people that are, like you said to yourself, a breed in dogs that probably shouldn't be bred. So I'll, you know, I'll get a puppy in and I'll do a consult and I'll say, did you meet mum and dad? Yeah, I met mum. How was that? Well, I couldn't get near her. Oh. Why, why Why not? Uh, well, she, they said she's normally fine, but since she's had the puppies, like she's getting really defensive. And I know that mum is going to be a bag of nerves, but yeah. they don't give a shit. And then that's an excuse. And sometimes the mother can get a little bit defensive when they've just had pups and their temperament can change a little bit, like temporarily. But I'm um, hearing that same story over and over again. Or, no, we didn't meet the parents. Yeah. So, like, we've got to be meeting the parents. And then the second thing... I think people, uh, we're seeing more and more nervous puppies that develop into aggressive dogs, mm. is um, we believe puppies are made of glass. So we take a puppy and we think they're going to break any little hurdle. And then if you do that enough, the puppy believes they're made of glass. Yeah. Because of like, we won't get them to walk through the puddle or we won't get them to like jump on the sofa with us. And we we like every everyday little like hurdles and difficulties, we allow them to skirt around. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we pick them up and they yelp a little bit like they panic and we put them down or like they they don't want to walk anymore and we pick them up and, and we start thinking that our puppy is just going to break. Yeah. And then once we do that enough and we like, and we move around our puppy as if they are made of sugar glass what happens is they believe they're made of sugar, sugar yeah. glass and this is really prevalent with like smaller dogs like your duxies and things yeah. like that whereas like we're scaremongered that they were going to break their back at any fucking little stress right and that's not the case so they then believe but it's starting to happen with all dogs and every dog's now and like more often than not like we get a puppy class in and the dog starts at 12 weeks old we have six dogs in Three of those dogs are nervous, like really right. nervous. Now, a puppy, if it's well bred, should be like a sponge, like ready to take yeah. on new information of the world and not having to like counter condition things. Yeah. But in the last year or so, like we're seeing more and more Gosh. dogs that are starting off yeah. that way. I bet there's so many parallels with parenting. I'm not a parent. Are you a no, parent? No. Um, no, I'm a dog person, not yeah. a child person. But from what you see i've got a friend that works with you know children who have go who have grown up normally in very loving homes yeah that end up kind of turning on their parents and being very aggressive yeah yeah, yeah. and you almost see that same pattern with what's going on with the children and what's gone on with the dogs yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. so yeah. more yeah. often than not when we're seeing like aggression in 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 dogs it's not because they've been abused yeah. unfortunately the reality is if a dog's been abused they're like really shut down and reserved mm -hmm. like they're not forward aggressive at all yeah and like their dogs you have to really build back up the dogs that are forward aggressive are often like nervous and then they like developed um and they've matured sorry and then that nervousness is like then learns aggression like my nervousness can go away when i'm aggressive right um and if i show my teeth and growl and bark like you go away and give me what i want which is space yeah, yeah. or um dogs that and some some cases have just been given so little boundaries mm -hmm. that like they're just utilizing they aggression as, as a behavioral mechanism to do what they to get yeah. what they want right yeah. and sometimes that's as much as like picking up a sock and like goading the owner into like hey take it off me growl okay we, oh shit i didn't see this coming and they're like oh aggression's kind of fun yeah um there's obviously lots that tie into that like we're not fulfilling the dog and uh and, and all the stuff and then maybe health issues and ailments and allergies and all the rest of it like that can underpin aggression but um like like you said with kids like sometimes we can get owners bringing us a dog different breeds and maybe a rottweiler maybe a cockapoo all they've done in their head is done absolutely right by that dog. Yeah. These are like really nice people with families, with nice jobs. And like, then, then we're not talking about scroats or anything here. Yeah. Like really nice people. <laughs> and yet they have a 10 month old, very aggressive dog. And it's not their fault. All they've done is try to do right by the dog. And sometimes that's like too little discipline. Sometimes that's not fulfilling the dog enough. And sometimes it's just like being over coddling with the dog yeah like we see a, we see a lot of that and uh, you can't do that with a big strong breed yeah now a taboo word in the dog trainer sphere is is dominance but more dogs um so there are certain breeds of dogs that are a little bit more handler challenging than other dogs and that can be your XL bully that can be your male rottweiler for example yeah. than perhaps your female fox red labrador yeah, right yeah. there are going to be certain dogs that 
like go through a little bit of ranking like hey I'm going to push your buttons and I'm going to see what you're going to do about it because if, if I push your buttons perhaps I can make my life a little bit easier because you're going to do more as you're told than I'm going to do as I'm told yeah. right <laughs> like that's dogs that's the nature of dogs like that is going to get uh, to a point and sometimes and we see that a lot in like your male bull breeds in yeah, particular yeah yeah um, and it's hard, isn't it? Because you can't... I think particularly the media, they want to put their finger on what the issue is. Yeah. And I think, you know, a lot of it in the media has come down to this sort of class issue around these dogs. Yes. You know, yes. these are the sorts of people that have these dogs. Yeah. You know, we're actually attacking the people rather than the, the dog. But I think that there is... You can't pin it down to something. There is going to be genetics. I think, you know, there is going to be breeding. There is going to be ownership. Um, it's it's a shame that we live somewhere where 30 years ago this legislation that was described as the worst piece of legislation that the government had thrown together is now being reenacted. Obviously, mm -hmm. that's why we're challenging it um, from a legal perspective. But I think no matter what happens, you know, no matter what happens with our campaign, what's going to happen in a few years time? And it will there be an is this a government case study for adding more dogs? Mm -hmm. We know that there's already a, am I allowed to say this like a force free agenda with a lot of the yep. sort of way that the government is looking at things like banning the e collar, etc. Yep. And then you also have things about the dog sports and stuff like that, that seems to be sort of getting a little bit more attention yep. in the media. Yep. So is it gonna be that we're gonna have to be a nation of cockapoos because that's all yep. we're allowed yeah, yeah, yeah. So, anymore? Yeah, you're, you're, you're spot on. So if we keep banning tools, we're gonna have to keep banning strong dogs. Mm -hmm. um, we keep doing things like dog sports, where we're gonna build and create strong dogs with the necessity for tools are gonna come into play, regardless of what people say, because we create dogs um, who has who have certain drives that are going to override everything, and that's including food and toys, right? So uh, we're at like this catch twenty two. Yeah. Like the more the more we take away from owners to keep those dogs safe to themselves and those around them, the more dog breeds we're going to ban. Yeah. So when it comes to crates and then leads that are going to be around the dog's neck, that that will happen. Uh, we're going to have more fatalities. We're going to have more issues. We're going to have more dog on dog attacks. We're going to have more dog human attacks. And then eventually what's going to happen is that ban list is going to grow yeah. because of like, we're losing our strongest dogs and then we're going to start losing the lesser strong dogs, but still strong dogs. So like your XLs and your Corsos will go and your Malinois, your Dobermans, your Rottweilers mm -hmm. will go. Shepherds will last a little bit longer because of like, they're more iconic. Um, but and the eventually, police association. And the yeah. police is associated with them. Uh, but eventually they'll go so long as they keep taking away our tools mm -hmm. and mechanisms in order to keep those dogs safe, such as like you crates, like some yeah. some countries have banned crates. Yeah. So they're going to end up with like a bunch of overtired, overstimulated dogs that probably like lack boundaries. And that's going to then have a knock on effect to, to behaviors. Then we're going to get more dog issues and then. Like I said, that list is going to grow. We're going to end up like, I don't know, it doesn't Italy have like a, a very long banned breed list? Oh, um, was it Egypt? Switzerland. Oh, somewhere. There are countries where it's literally everything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like you're only allowed like 12 dogs or whatever. And then what I find really interesting is America, who are normally, let's face it, not the best at mm -hmm. these sorts of things, and, and Canada, <laughs> are actually, seem to be more embracing of, first of all, uh, they call it they quite often call it breed neutral legislation okay. where it's not about the breed the breeds are relevant it's okay. about the owner of the situation what's going on all that type of thing yep. um and they that's obviously where a lot of the dog sports are coming from as well isn't it yeah so it's almost like they're a bit more embracing an alternative yeah um, yeah yeah um potentially the dog sports one's a tricky one like it only accounts for a very small yeah. population but um okay fine well <laughs> do they have any banned dogs in america uh there are so in america they don't do it by the whole country they do it by I don't, I don't know if it's even state it might even be sort of like your county type citywide all right because okay. i i know that i've seen a lot about certain areas where they've gone this 
you know, maybe not Louisiana, but this place in Louisiana has now repealed their citywide pit bull ban and they're going for this breed neutral way forward. Um, you know, and I think the education piece comes in with that as well because, and funnily enough, there was a trial in South London a few years ago that got, got wrote up in a, in a big report for the government about responsible dog ownership. Yep. The government paid 70 grand for that report. Yeah. done nothing with it mm. but this trial was looking at when there are dog incidents yeah. instead of um whatever they might have done previously find the owner which does nothing yeah, yeah they yeah. looked at an education method yeah. of uh, almost like your speed awareness course yeah so when you start to apply that then you have somebody that actually learns how to be a more responsible owner yeah rather than just oh i'll pay the 50 quid fine so that was found to be really successful and i think they do a lot more of that in the states uh, interesting and particularly Canada. I guess the difficulty is like who, who's going to provide that educational information? Like, is it going to be really, really simple to the point that like we can all agree, or is it going to get a little bit intricate where myself and and dog trainer B are going to like really disagree? Oh on something? yeah, like, I think so. that's that is a, so. This is the thing that I've learned as a so obviously don't have a campaigning background. I have a normal job. I'm a normal person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've fallen into the, all of yeah, this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but what I have learned about campaigning, particularly when you're trying to campaign for, for change, you have to have a, like a top line message that everyone can get behind. Yeah. Less licensed dogs because it's better for animal welfare and yeah. it makes owners and breeders more responsible. Mm -hmm. People can go, I can get behind that. Yeah. And actually the amount of people that have reached out to us that, do, that have shih tzus and pugs and they've yeah. gone i believe in this cause yeah even though they don't have a dog that's affected so you've kind of got that level then when you start to get a bit more into the detail and the nitty-gritty that's mm -hmm. when you can start to have people disagree and and this that and the other and i think yeah, yeah. one area that is not my area yeah. is the training how do you regulate training in the yeah. uk and i've had conversations with it about with with a few trainers and i think that this is an area that has definitely got room for disagreement because we already know that in the sort of government yeah. area yeah. is the more force free, um, you know, and even if you can be on the same page with another trainer, you might train differently. I don't know. We it's... have to remember the reason why the, the government's agenda has perhaps fallen on the force free side is it appeals to more people. Yeah. Because of like, there's nothing you want you as a political from a political standpoint you don't want to argue that potentially putting an animal through discomfort is in its actual uh, overall best interest, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, from their point of view, it's, it's easier to go, like, oh, no, we'll agree with these people because they believe and they have these scientific studies that suggest, like, if you, you can just utilise food and management to the point that, like, you can change this dog's behaviour for the better. Now, when you start understanding dogs and work with bigger, stronger dogs that uh, go into certain states of arousal that are they're only going to be brought out of with some aversion... We know that's not actually the case, and and like that's where the difficulty lies. So, the problem with our XL bullies and like higher drive like bull breed dogs, if we don't have control of them when they're in a heightened state mm. of drive, they can kind of lose it a little bit, and sometimes genetics can take over. And when yeah. we don't have an uh, an um, absolute certainty on how these dogs are genetically made up and what breeds they're made up from we can't guarantee when they go into that really heightened state of drive what they're going to do so mm. the example i gave you earlier was when a golden retriever goes into a heightened state of drive it falls back to what its uh, genetic innate desires and that's going to be pick up something to retrieve yeah. to their owner when we have a game bred dog or a fighting bred dog that's potentially bred into our 2024 version of a xl bully we don't know whether that genetic component is going to take over when that dog goes into yeah. a state of drive so this is why sometimes we see our xl bullies are like playing with the owner so there's a video out there of a dog just like jumping over a fence and yeah. having fun and then latching onto the owner that's because it's gone to a heightened state of drive a genetic component of that dog has taken over and that part of its brain has told it told it to bite and hold on to something yeah. because of there's a certain part of that dog that was created for that once upon a time so we have to accept that there's a genetic element to certain dogs behaviors um but it's really really important that when we have that genetic predisposition to do certain things that are potentially dangerous for our pet dog to do, that we are able, even when in a heightened state of arousal, to maintain control of them. 
Now, when they're in a heightened state of arousal, adrenaline kicks in. And when adrenaline kicks in, typically food acquisition turns off. So when yeah. you're on a roller coaster, you don't want to be thinking about eating ice cream at the time, no matter how hungry you are, right? So bringing the dog out of a state of drive with food or potentially even toys, um, toys will perpetuate the drive, uh, it's just not going to happen. So that's where, like, pain compliance comes in. Like, yeah. hey, you're being bad. You're doing something that is going to lead to you being uncomfortable. Like, you really need to calm down. So if you've ever been into like a jujitsu gym or anything like that and you get choked out for the first time, you suddenly like relax really fucking quickly. And sometimes that's because of like you've had an imposed danger put in front of you and you need to really calm down to concentrate on how to avoid that danger. And that's where kind of we have to say, OK, there is a time and a place to tell a dog like you need to come out of this state of drive right now because I don't know where your genetics are going to take you. Right. So and this is my main argument about like how sometimes it's a good idea to use tools with certain breeds of dogs. And we get it with Malinois a lot, like when their prey drive takes over. This is why, like you see a lot of Malinois and also like hunt point retrieve dogs on e-collars and things like this because of when their genetics take over, like they fuck off and don't yeah. come back. So this is why we need to say, hey, like doing that in this moment is going to be uncomfortable to you. Come back. But on the other side of things, there's going to be a dog trainer over there that's maybe sitting in Parliament opposite myself and arguing the converse. Yes. And this is like... It's, that's where it gets tough. That's where it gets really what, difficult. What I really like about what you said was, I wonder how many people have learned something from that. Because I, I did work with a trainer early on with my dog. Yep. And one of the things I was taught was to manage that arousal. Yep. learn how to switch it off okay. make all your training involve this yep. play 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 yep. enough da, yep. da, da, enough yep. and i i did that mm -hmm. with him and i feel like he's pretty good at being able to at, at knowing but i know exactly what you mean where you can see them get more and more excited mm -hmm. and you think actually if this was a dog that didn't have these boundaries or didn't have these rules and then what could that turn into yeah, um, yeah, yeah. potentially you know yeah. and it's it's um I wonder how many people have not done that type of work with a dog that probably needs it. Yeah, so it's, like um, it's just basic arousal regulation. So like a common um, exercise we do here is um, play with the dog and then go straight into place work. As soon as the dog chin right. comes on the floor, like we're going to come out, we're going to play again and it just gets them going oh, okay. from up and down, up and down, up and down. Some dog trainers are going to argue to never put your dog in that heightened state of arousal like just keep under threshold Fuck like me. everything like when, when, when if, if you see that dog going that way we're going to like fold our arms turn around we're going to disengage we're going to disassociate and we're never going to perpetuate the dog going to that state of arousal now unfortunately there's things in our environment that are going to trigger our dog's arousal yeah and if we have not prepared ourselves to deal with our dog in that heightened state of arousal then we're like lost we're lost without a paddle yeah. Like we're fucked. We can't do anything. Just cross our fingers and hope. So it's really important that we do work our dogs in high states of arousal and be able to what we call cap that, which is like shut it off as quick as possible. Yeah, yeah. Calm down and then come back into arousal because of like certain prey animals are going to trigger our dog's arousal. We've seen it with XL bullies and sheep. We've seen it with XL bullies and, and joggers or, or cyclists and, mm -hmm. and things that like run away and make high pitched noises. Yeah. That, that Yeah. So we've got those couple of videos in London of the girl running away, making the high pitched noise. That's the dog in a heightened state of arousal like we need to be able to bring our dog out of that and again like the role of aversion plays a little bit of a part there um to again just bring the revs down a little bit and and like you said maybe people don't know that and again this is why like proper dog training education comes in place of like maybe explaining this is why we should look at certain avenues in terms of training our dog to make sure that when they're an adult like we're going to keep them really really safe yeah. Right. So I've got a working line Malinois and it's no secret that he's a bull herder. Like he's had a bull breed mix into him to add a little bit of tenacity. It would be really irresponsible of me if I lost control of him while he's in a high state of arousal because when the genetics of that dog takes over, it's chase and bite. Right. Yeah. It could be a cyclist, a kid on a bike or whatever. So I've got a couple of options. I can either cap that and learn like sometimes no means fucking no and you need to come back to heal. Or I could just like keep him on a lead and hope. If I yeah. keep him on a lead and hope, like chances are he's not going to be fulfilled and the un unwanted behavior is going to perpetuate. And s m uh, I might mismanage the dog, like go of the lead one day or whatever. The long line, I might step out of the, and, and he might get a hold of someone or whatever. That's me being irresponsible. So again, if we're going to have big, strong breeds, we need to be prepared to do the, the, the big, strong work, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah. So the 
I always give the same analogy, like the bigger engine of the car we have, the better set of brakes we need. Yeah. And if we put shitty brakes on them, we're going to crash it and the, the dog's going to come off the road, right? So. so do you think if owners of certain breeds or certain sizes of dogs had to go and work with a trainer that understood all of that and then we'd be in a better place today, basically? <laughs> You'd like to think so, right? <laughs> You'd like to think so. Like, um, uh, I know I've spoken to Chris about this and, and we're very much on the same page. Um, but yeah, like uh, an understanding of those key words like drive and arousal and making sure our dog um, and learning about what triggers our dog. Like We can all agree on that, like yeah. regardless, of, uh, regardless of what camp you're from. Uh, arousal can be friend or foe. And uh, the main problem I see with these type of uh, dogs is, is mismanaged arousal. Like yeah. you see all these videos the dog is in like... Um, a state of arousal there's no coming back from. Yeah, I do wonder. It's really difficult when you when you start to talk about the the dog attacks that we've seen in the media, mm. and it's it's always a kind of conversation that when I've done media interviews, I've tried to avoid because it's not something you really want to get into with no. a reporter. But what I find is, what is the situation? We never learn the situation. All we learn is this dog's attacked, and we yes. never know what was the circumstances. What yeah. was the background to that dog what was that dog living in was yeah. that and i i did worry when the ban got put into place and we were getting messages from people saying i've not walked my dog because i don't have a muzzle or i'm scared yeah. my dog's going to get taken and i was thinking we could see a rise in attacks now because yeah, yeah, you've got yeah. frustrated dogs that yeah, are being kept sure, indoors yeah. um and luckily you know it, we've not seen anything in terms of escalation there but you know it's 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 fatalities it's it's horrible it's you know it's it's unacceptable and and i do agree that that things need to be done to but i think this um the fact that banning the xl bully will now keep the public safe is uh it's not 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 the case at all <laughs> yeah. right um, yeah yeah so uh, yeah like you said people only start recording whilst the attack's happening so we don't see anything like pre-attack we don't know anything about the dog's circumstances where it's bred from or how it's been trained or how it's not received training what yeah. tools it's wearing at the time um and i know i'm waffling on about tools and things and i'm not saying like if you use a prong or an e-collar your dog is going to be absolutely fine there's so much that underpins aggression from the dog's health to how fulfilled he is to what literally what type of food he eats and if we're mm -hmm. on a good diet we don't know what type of food those dogs are eating and things like yeah. that um for a dog to like show forward aggression to a human though and like continually like a german shepherd or a malinois they're gonna be like fuck off and then like back up or whatever it's right. usually stemmed from but for a dog to go for like into forward aggression and like pursue it is really 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 rare yeah. so um yeah. i don't know i very rarely comment on for the reasons that you explained um another problem i have with the 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 regulation that the dogs need to wear muzzles is before this the only dogs that needed a were, that were wearing muzzles were dogs that needed to wear muzzles, right? Yeah. Now they've all got muzzles on. The general public, for the most part, are presuming that the dog is only wearing that muzzle because of law requires it to do so. Right. Meaning that like people are just going up to like muzzle dogs left, right, and centre, thinking like you're all go you're a good boy, I can tell, and the dog's like going at them and shit like that, and then they're going, oh, like no, you are actually really <laughs> aggressive. Shit. Yeah. And then it's just perpetuating. People have asked me, do less people come up to you? Do people avoid you now? The dog, the dog's on a muzzle, so it must look more scary. And actually, I found that people are more willing to approach because yeah. they're like, oh, this poor dog. He's been it used to be a it. deterrent. Now it's not. Yeah, it's just yeah. the, the norm, right? Yeah. And I think actually what would be really good to ask you as a trainer, which is something that I've said, we need to know this, is a lot of us who have muzzled dogs now yeah. that were not muzzled before. Yeah. So the sorts of things that I used to do with my dog out and about, yeah. I can't do anymore. Yeah, we yeah. can't play. We can't, I, how can I throw a toy or a ball for him? Yeah. Um, so any tips or any thing that you can do to sort of work your dog while you're, while you're out? So I think um, you can obviously play with your dog at home. Uh, this type of dog that we're talking about is going to want to get into that like competitive play element. Like that's going to be their bread and butter, right? That's what they're going to really fucking love to do. They're going to want to get hold of something and they're going to want to rag it around. Like whether we fucking like it or not, that's what they're going to want to do. <laughs> and it's a little itch on the back that they're going to want to satiate. And if we don't satiate that, it's going to come out elsewhere. So like it's a really good idea to satiate that. And it's also a really good idea to show your dog in what context they're allowed to do that. 
Okay. So, for example, I will only ever do bite work with my dog on here when he's wearing a particular collar. Oh, right. So when he's got that collar on and we've been through a little bit of a protocol, he knows his opportunity to bite is on the cards, right? So he's going to go fucking wired to the moon. So then he starts looking for the decoys and he starts going into like that work mode. And we can really strip that back and, and, and do the same thing for our XL bully on a really lower level and just teach him that the only place you're allowed to go into your very highest state of drive is in my garden. Yep. Anytime we're outside of that, you're never allowed to go into fifth gear because there's st stuff there that are potentially like dangerous if you interact with that whilst you're in fifth gear, right? So you're absolutely fine just to play with your dogs at home and let them satiate that prey and competitive drive through the means of play in your controlled environment. Again, referencing my dog, I don't want him to think that opportunities going to that highest state of drive is on the cars when we're down the local park, like when yeah. his kid's knocking around, right? Yeah. So, like, I'm fine with that. He gets all his high drive stuff here. And for you guys at home, that could be your garden. And then, obviously, our bullies are wearing their muzzles out and about, so we're not going to be able to do that sort of stuff. We can do some obedience work, but what I would recommend is, like, scent work and tracking. Yeah. So you can even teach some article indications and like it's not my forte. I've never really been into it. Um, but there's some great like online courses and workshops around where you can start teaching your dog. And every dog loves to use their nose because it's part of the predatory sequence and every dog has a prey drive. So being able to give your dog like a little bit of a task and a task that is almost limitless on how hard we can make it allows us to start giving our job uh, dogs something that they genuinely believe to be a job. So as long as you've got food motivation in your dog, then um, ultimately you be able to like really start playing with different avenues when it comes to scent work, whether you're like asking them to indicate on a certain scent at a vehicle or you've just got three plant pots turned upside down and they've got to go find which the 10 pound note is in or whatever yeah. right so um that's again, so interesting not my forte but the you'd argue the most like fulfilled and stimulated dogs on the world are like your cadaver detecting dogs and things like that so yeah. like you can really create a happy dog that has a really good work ethic through scent work never been something that's really fascinated myself so i've never really done it because of like i've got a malinois not a labrador <laughs> um but you can do it with any dog especially your bullies like so yeah. i would start uh, pushing owners into doing that with their dog and like whilst their head is down and like interacting with the environment they're going to worry about less what's going on around them and things like that as well and like literally they're down nose on the floor minding their own business and they're not going to get themselves yeah. in trouble so your high drive stuff can happen at work uh, at home your controlled environment you get your to tug toy or whatever you give the dog 10 minutes to calm down you go for a walk like your no dog or owner is getting anything from being walked on shortly down the fucking pavement for 20 minutes so like get to a field um, follow all your protocols. What's the law on length of lead you're allowed oh, to use? Oh, it's, it's ropey. Uh, it's, some people say that it's a short lead. Yeah. Um, from all the reading that we have done, yeah. as long as you have the dog under control, it's on a lead. Okay. I use a flexi lead, yeah, a long so lead or a long you lead. You can use a flexi point. lead, yeah. a six foot line, a 10 foot line, yeah. a 10 meter line or whatever. And you can like lay out a track for your dog and get him to try. Like they, he, your dog, I promise you at home would fucking love to do that. Yeah. Whoever's listening to this, like if you get into it, your dog has the right food motivation. There's nothing more that they, the, they like doing than like finding things with their nose. So yeah. All right. Don't worry too much. There's still like amazing avenues you still have with you, with your dog. And, and that can be through the form of, of, of scent work. Just yeah. don't come to me and ask how to do it because I don't know. <laughs> no, it's, it's good. Just not I mean, thing. I joke. We joke. My dad thinks my dog's got some hound in him because he's like, I've never seen a bull breed dog use their nose as much as he does. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I will go and give that a go, definitely. Yeah. So I, I guess like lots of people are doing all their licky mats and Kong filled Kongs and stuff at home. Like nothing's going to be getting out on grass and yeah. like scatter feeding is another thing you can do. Like you can get their daily food portion. You can go out. Um, into a field you've got your 10 meter line on as long as they can eat through their muzzle you can just just fucking yeet the food everywhere and just let them spend like 20 minutes just getting that like they'll yeah. enjoy that like using their nose um is an underutilized tool that um that, that we don't explore enough with our like everyday pet dogs that's good that's gonna be so helpful for bully owners because i feel like i've been looking for ideas of what can i do i we, start running with mine but not everyone yeah, can run with go. their yeah, dog no. so yeah, maybe there is a bonus like, your, your candy cross type stuff um 
I know a couple of places, and this will be controversial, but like your slap mills and things like that, like dogs, it's like a treadmill for a dog uh, to really like very rarely do we get give a dog an opportunity to run as fast as they fucking want in a straight line for as long as they want, which is much further than the space we probably have for them, especially yeah. if they can't go off a lead than we can on like a slap mill. Okay. So it's literally just like it, it's powered by the dog. Yeah. We've got one here. We very, very rarely use it. But like once you get a dog on there, like a staff or something on there, and they realize they can just open up, they're like as soon as they see it, like throwing themselves on it, like yeah, yeah. wanting to go. So there's things like that. There's your bungee stuff. So like um, doing like runaway games and like getting your dog to pull a bungee, like a bungee cord t towards you is like a, you, you can obviously do your weight pull stuff and things like that. Yeah. I know Chris is big on all this sort of stuff. Um, and just like stimulating your dog in different ways other than just like walking them like fucking, yes, you got to walk them on a lead. Yes, they got to wear a muzzle, but that's probably the like the most boring thing you can do with your dog anyway. Though, yeah. It? As long as you've got this amount of space in your garden, you can play with your dog, you can do your scent work and there's all supplementary stuff yeah. you can do. I think a lot of people, you know, prior to the ban, there was this feeling of my life is going to change forever mm -hmm. and my dog's life is going to change forever. And mm -hmm. I know that for some people it's even worse than that because people have faced being evicted over their breed or, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, there, there's been all sorts of horrendous stories. But I think for the most part, a lot of people that are just living with it now, yeah. we, we still get our dog and yeah. there are still opportunities to have a fulfilled dog it's just about finding the right way to do it different avenues um, of course of course um but yeah i didn't know about that the the length of lead so fingers crossed that's good can i ask about this court case that's due court to happen case. next yeah. week mm -hmm. by the time this podcast comes out you'll have a result so can we talk yeah. about that briefly so from the beginning we originally started as don't ban me license me we wanted to put educational kind of content out there around first of all the ban and what it entailed because there was so much misinformation floating around yeah particularly before we knew what the ban was because don't yeah. forget rishi announced the ban yeah and then it was like two months later when we actually knew what the details were yeah um, so it became clear that there was an opportunity to challenge the government on the legislation. Yep. It's not an appeal. It's not, I don't like this law, please change it. Yeah. It's a, a challenge of the way the law was made. Because if the government do not lay law properly yep. and follow a due process, yes. then there's room for them that to be overturned, essentially, yeah. or changed or whatever. Yeah. So we found out that there was an opportunity for a legal challenge as a group that had been fairly, um, let's say, kind of PC in how we talked about the ban in, yeah. in until, you know, in terms of the stuff we were putting out. And um, we were asked if we would take on that on, that yeah. legal challenge. Yeah. Um, started to go fund me, raised £200,000 roughly. Jesus. Um, probably I've, I've, people in the dog world have described it to me as probably the most successful dog campaign um, in that sense. I can imagine. Um, launched this, uh, it's called a judicial review process yep. where we're asking a judge to look at the evidence of how this ban was, was or how this law was brought into place yep. and decide actually the government have not followed process so i'm going to go back and tell them that they need to revisit this yeah 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 yeah. that's essentially what we're doing yeah we have a court case next week which obviously by the time this comes out will be done we will either be granted permission for judicial review yeah which means which would be the, the best possible outcome yeah although even with a judicial review it could still result in the ban coming into place yeah they would just have to go back and do all, it all gotcha. properly uh but that's the only option. Gotcha. Um, or it could be turned down for permission for judicial review. Could go either way. Um, we had, you know, a disappointing case before Christmas where we were hoping to get an injunction against the ban to prevent it coming in so quickly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and that was denied by the judge, which was obviously a really big blow. Um, of course. For, you know, for, for a lot of people who were facing eviction and things yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and for the, uh, yeah, so for all sorts. But I think we're at a stage now where our legal team have said it could go either way. Yeah. Literally different judge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hopefully a judge that's got a dog. You yeah, never know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think despite all of that, the important thing is, first of all, people people chose to put money in because they believed that this law was not the right way to do things. Yes. 
Um, and that's incredible that, that, you know, that amount of money was raised for, for that purpose. And I also think it's really important to hold the government to account. Yeah, for when, sure. When do you ever get the just, chance to do that? Yeah, yeah. Even if it's just to call them out on this to make sure that mistakes are made in the future regarding yeah. other things, maybe even beyond dogs. But, yeah. um, you know, other banning of other breeds, especially because if it's just going to it will it will carry on. It'll be Corsos next. Because you, I was going to say these are going to. Mm -hmm. Um, shift onto the Corsos and they're going to get really popular and there's a hell of a lot of nerve in that type of dog your Corsos, your Presser I would argue they're a more nervy than the XL but um, there's just a hell of a lot less of them Yeah. so uh, we'll just wait for that wave to come and then you think if the government have used this ban as a test run for mm -hmm. banning more breeds mm -hmm. at least we've been able to challenge it and at least they won't be able to go about things the same way in the future because you know there will be a group of people out there who will say actually we're not having this so yeah. i think i do think it's important to challenge the government and i know that a lot of people have been left kind of disappointed it was very with much out of nowhere wasn't it it was very quick like applied really quick like it just left a field yeah, it was it was crazy how it happened. Oh I'm yeah, really uh, surprised by that. I in fact, when he first announced it, I thought surely not. Like it can't just happen like that. What was it that like? What was the the nail in the coffin? There was a rise in attacks. Yeah, that would be, and I I definitely noticed as a bully owner. Oh, this dog that I've got is becoming more and more apparent in the media. Do you feel, feel social pressure from that, just being an everyday dog owner with this type of dog? Or I So when we when we considered getting a dog, we were thinking about getting a staffy. I always think, what if we got a staffy? Life would be so different. Yeah. <laughs> and thought about getting a staffy, actually met a few bullies and thought, um, oh, this is a nice dog. You yeah. know, a bit bigger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like the outdoors, wanted to get out a bit more, thought maybe this is a bit of a better breed. Did quite a bit of research, decided to get one. Um, also really researched the breeding as well. I think, you know, some there were, obviously there were some responsible steps that I took along the way. Yeah. But I was always aware, I grew up with boxers. I grew up with a very reactive boxer as well. So I knew how difficult it was to have a dog that hated other dogs. Yes. Um, so I was always conscious, I need to get this right. People are going to judge even before all the media. Yeah. And then the media started to escalate. And mm. I was like, oh. Um, and that's when I started to get a bit political on TikTok. And I think, I think this is important for people as well. You know, if I could put a message out there for people who do have, you know, either bigger dogs or stigmatised dogs or feel strongly about something. Yeah. You, there's always something you can do to, to campaign or write to your MP or let's say you live in an area where off-lead dogs run riot. Yeah, yeah, in the yeah. local parks and I live in London and I've put forward to my council please can we have Wednesday mornings all dogs on lead in X park yeah, yeah. Thursday afternoons all dogs on lead in this park yeah how much that would make a difference for people who have got reactive dogs or who are training their dogs and you know so I think there's always it sometimes feel like oh what's the point what can one person do I mean we are 10 regular dog owners that have no experience in campaigning or government or political apart from our solicitors obviously legal yeah 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 yeah. but you can make a difference if you feel strongly about something and i will credit you for how big your balls are <laughs> because of like yeah like i don't i don't i don't think i would have had it in me i yeah, really don't so like kudos for that um because there's been a hell of a lot of work gone into it, right? And to raise like that amount of money, like you said, I don't think it's been done on the in the, the dog spectrum before. So, what final like message do you have for XL bully owners? For XL bully owners, is there hope? It's, um, I, I, do you know what? I think um, there is hope, and you know we don't know what way this is going to go um, mm -hmm. with the with the legal stuff. Um, I know a lot of people have already had that feeling of, oh, I've given up now. I've accepted that this is my life. But, you know, in terms of things like how can you make your dog's life better, think about some of the things that you've said today. You can, your dog can still have a life and can still have a fulfilling life. And looking at how you can engage with your local authorities, you know, 
campaign to have a private field built mm-hmm. somewhere or com- a community, you know, something. You, you can make a difference. Um, you just need to find that little gang, uh, yeah, which yeah, I'm yeah. very lucky to have um, in the team, um, you know, that have got the same vision as you. And, and um, you know, I think, I think just keep being, a, if you're a responsible dog owner, just keep being a responsible dog owner and keep... Um, sort of educating people about about the ban because I think the biggest misconception is it's a muzzle and a lead so what and yeah, I think yeah. I think it's important to educate um quickly on that do you think there's a chance so in my experience like a muzzle can make a dog more defensive because we take away their main tool yeah so it's like we have our hands tied behind our back so it might overemphasize the uh, response from our dog in order to create distance because I can't fight you when you do eventually get here do you, is there if you is that if you is that something you've seen or I do you know what a lot of people that would be have, my argument against the muzzle. Yeah, a lot of people have messaged us saying things like my dog's changed since they've worn a muzzle. Is that what you mean? And yeah. and so whether that's that the whether that's that other dogs are more aggressive to their dog wearing a muzzle, which mm-hmm. we've seen, um, or whether their dog is a bit more shut down or their dog's a, a different way. Um, I think I don't know. Every dog's different. My dog definitely, as much as I've done all the conditioning. He mm-hmm. doesn't like it being put on. Right. When it's on, he's fine. He's normal. Which um, then you've done a very good job because if, like most dogs are going to prefer to not wear a muzzle than they are a muzzle, yeah. right? So like conditioning is really difficult, like really, really difficult. And there's a million and one ways you can do it. And I know dog trainers do it all different ways. But um, yeah, that is, a, that is a tricky one because it does, it does limit the dog, I guess. But um, still got your long line. You still got your, all your other things you can do with your dog and like... Like like we've both said, a common theme throughout our conversation today is like you can still fulfil your dog without, you know, having to just take them on that boring, you know, two foot, three foot lead walk around the block. Like yeah, there's loads yeah. of other things you can do with your dog. So yeah. Like, my dogs never leave here, really. Like I don't take them for walks. They just fucking train and, and dick around here. Obviously, we've got a, a decent sized space, but, you know, they're fulfilled. They're happy. They go home and just sleep on the sofa and, and do nothing all night, every night. Yeah. So. I think that's it. You have to think you're no longer, you're no longer, not that I, I never did this anyway, but you're no longer ever just able to just walk, let your dog off and just let them run around and come back. Like that's, those days are gone, but yeah, you yeah. can still, and actually, because my day job is all to do with kind of well-being and all that side of things, is that there? it is so fulfilling to go out with your dog and and help them to be fulfilled yeah, yeah, yeah. you know and you're not on your phone you're not distracted you're you're focused on your dog mm-hmm. um, and for me that's that's something that i love about the time that i spend with my dog and that's why I've, i guess i've got more interested in the training um don't want to be a dog trainer but i no, I, sure? I enjoy the dog training side of things sure you don't want to be a dog trainer? No. <laughs> why not I love my day. I just want to go back to being a normal person. And yeah. Oh, all this is going to blow over. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Okay, we'll wrap it up on there. Thank you very much for coming in. Very nice to speak to you. And we'll have a result by the time this goes out. But all the best next week in Thank the uh, court case. Thank you very much.